Beloved, as God calls us into worship, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord and confess together, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Amen. We lift up our voices again in praise, hymn number 79, 1 and 2. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we bless your holy name. We acknowledge you as the great Yahweh, Elohim, the great God, creator, sustainer, governor of the universe, clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. We acknowledge you as the source of all life, for you are life itself. We acknowledge that true life is to know you, O eternal God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We acknowledge that you are the one, by the power of your Spirit, who brings new life into the world, as children are conceived and born, that you are the one who sustains our life, that when you withdraw your spirit, when you hide your face and take away the breath of any living being, they die and return to the dust. We thank you that you are the God of life who moves across the face of the earth in the spring to bring forth new life out of the cold, barren winter ground, that you are the one that brings forth plants and flowers and shoots and buds, that you bring forth green and living things to fill the world with beauty and to provide food for man and animal. And we praise you, Lord, for the life that you grant. And as we gather this afternoon in a world mired in death, a world which experiences death in so many ways because of the brokenness of a fallen and corrupt creation, a world which actually celebrates death in so many ways, we thank you that we are here to celebrate life the life that we have in the Lord Jesus, who came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And as you instruct us this afternoon, O oh God, teach us, lead us, show us the way to live in the light of life, to live in a way which brings life, not death, into 
the world. Teach us that, Lord, as we listen to your word this afternoon, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Let's turn in the scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 30. As we're dealing with the church's confession of scriptures, teaching about the sixth commandment, we look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through to 20 as a background reading. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 through to 20, this is the word of God. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. And in preparation for the sermon, let's sing hymn number 79, stanza 3. This afternoon we come to the Lord's Day 40 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Here the church confesses and summarizes what the Holy Scripture teaches about the meaning of the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. That's on page 555 in your book of praise. What does God require in the sixth commandment? I am not to dishonor hate, injure, or kill my neighbor by thoughts, words, or gestures, and much less by deeds, whether personally or through another. Rather, I am to put away all desire of revenge. Moreover, I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself. Therefore, also the government bears the sword to prevent murder. But does this commandment speak only of killing? By forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, such as envy, hatred, anger, and desire of revenge, and that he regards all these as murder. Is it enough then that we do not kill our neighbor in any such way? No, when God condemns envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to show patience, peace, gentleness, mercy, and friendliness toward him, to protect him from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is life. 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The world that God created reflects who he is. The psalmist says in Psalm 36, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. And in Acts chapter 17, the scripture says, he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And we sang that just before the service, that in him we move and, and live and live and move and have our being. Now, the life that God is and the life that God reflects into the creation is not just any kind of life. When we tend to think of life, we think of somebody who's breathing. Well, that's not what life is, merely breathing. You look at how God made the world. He made it a world teeming with life, with abundant life, the oceans, the air, the land. There were teeming masses of life, every kind of vegetation and flower and tree and shrub and animal and reptile and bird. There was life everywhere. And to get a little bit of a, a picture of it, you, you read the stories of the first explorers that came to the eastern coast of Canada many centuries ago, and they describe how there was just so much cod, there was just so much fish that it seemed that you could almost walk on the water. That's how teeming the ocean was with life. And that's in a fallen world. Imagine it before the fall. And in the midst of all of this glorious abundance of teeming life, of every type, God made only one man and, un, and, and one woman. Have you ever thought about that? God made stacks and stacks of every type of animal. Why did he just make one male and one female human? Well, the man and the woman are the most precious life in creation, human life. It is a special life, distinct from every other, because the life of the human was built in such a way as to reflect the image, the character of the creator in a most sublime way. So Adam and Eve were created to reflect God's glory, to reflect who he is, what his character is like. And so they were made, amongst other things, to reflect the fact that God brings forth life. And so the Lord gave them a command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's three ways of saying the same thing. Life, life, life. The way that God ordained the world to be filled with his sons and daughters, with worshipers of God, was through the holy marriage of a man and a woman producing holy seed, holy offspring, boys and girls, who, are, who come into their life through the deepest and most intimate love possible between two human beings. That's the way God set things up to work. That's how he ordained that the world would be filled with life which pro proceeds from love, pure and holy love. Well, that was how he ordained things to be, and that is not how we did it. He said, in the day that you eat of this forbidden fruit, you shall surely die. And that's because in eating of the forbidden fruit, we were cut off from God. And if you are cut off from God, if you are cut off from the source, you may still be breathing, but you're dead. And we all know what Adam and Eve's sin brought us. It cut us off from the source of life and it brought us 
a world of darkness and disease and death. It starts right away in the the first generation of children with Cain snuffing out Abel's life, and it gets worse and worse and worse through the generations. Have you ever thought about how much of our everyday life has to do with dealing with death? We're constantly fixing things which break down. We're constantly trying to avoid the death of our plants and our crops or all kinds of things that try to destroy them. We're constantly going to the doctor or working on our health because there's so many ways in which our health can go downhill and we can be confronted with that slow and unstoppable progress towards the grave. That's every day our body's dying a little more and we're getting closer to the end. And that's what the first sin brought in. They did the opposite of what God had ordained them to do. Now, if you open your Bible to Genesis chapter 9, take a careful look at what happens after the flood because the flood was death. The flood was death for most of the human race. It was death for most of the vegetation and the animals on the earth. And what the flood is is God bringing things back almost to the beginning of creation when there was just a watery mass over the the world. God is going to do a restart on creation with Noah and his sons. And you look at Genesis chapter 9 after the flood, and you look at verses 1 and 7, and children, count how many times God is commanding life here. So 9 verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's three, and now look at verse seven. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. And so you will have counted seven times that God ordains life, 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 life. Seven times. At the creation, he said it three times. Now he's kicking things off again after the flood, and he says it seven times, the number of fullness. And then stay there in chapter 9 and see in that context what God thinks about murder. You look at verse 5. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man... From his fellow men I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now that that commandment against murder is set in the middle of verses 1 and 7. That seven times God is saying, I want this world filled with life. I want you to reflect the fact that I am life. And so when you take a human life, you are working against the created order. You are working against my plans for the world. You are working against my very character. And so murder is a lot more than just stopping someone from living. But murder is an act of the highest treason. It is an act of blasphemy against the creator. Because God made the world to be full of life because a world which is full of life, as the scripture says, he did not create it to be uninhabited. A world which is full of life most glorifies the God of life. That's why in the new heavens and the new earth there will be a number which no man can number of worshipers. The number of the elect is not, you know, three and a half dozen. It's not like a very small, stingy number but there will be a number of saints that no man can count. The world will be full of the knowledge of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. That's what things are supposed to be like. And so to bring about the deliberate death of a human being made in the image of God as the crown of creation is to work against the very purpose of God, to blaspheme God, to stand against, to defy everything that he stands for. It is to detract from his glory. Every death is one score for the enemy. 
And so to take a human life is a most horrifying sin. It is to stand with Satan, that murderer from the beginning. It is to walk in concert with the kingdom of darkness, which wants less life and more death. And we see in the culture around us how the the Club of Rome from the early 1970s, the Club of Rome, which is pushing the idea that there are too many people on the earth and there aren't enough resources, so humans are a parasite on the earth and we need to bring down the population of the world. And we see that in the last 50 years or so, that vile and wicked ideology has metastasized and has taken hold not just of the World Economic Forum, but of many, many national governments who now see people as a parasite, people as a problem, population as something nauseating and unhealthy and bad for the world, the total opposite of what God has ordained. He says, seven times life, fill the earth, multiply, and the unbeliever says, no, We need less life, and so we will kill life in the womb, and we will kill the elderly, and we'll kill the vulnerable, and we'll kill the mentally ill, and we'll kill the depressed, and we'll starve millions through our insane policies which hate human life. That's the world in which we live, and that's the world in which God calls us as Christians to affirm life. Now, what are some applications as we consider the biblical teaching about life, what are some applications that we can draw? And I want to list a few here. First of all, Christians do not glorify the taking of human life. The world more and more sees human life as something cheap. And on the internet, whatever platform you're on, you can easily find all kinds of short videos showing people being hurt, attacked, beaten, killed. And the more we fill our minds with those things, whether they're real or whether they're in a game, the more life becomes cheapened and we just get used to seeing it snuffed out. That's a dangerous thing for our soul. And sometimes we read or we see news of police being forced to use lethal force to to take the life of someone or a citizen has to defend their life or their family's life by putting to death an attacker. And then, as a Christian, we can rejoice that justice has been done. We can rejoice that the innocent have been protected. But we've got to be very careful that we don't find pleasure in death, that we don't find a certain joy in seeing a human being having their life snuffed out. So, young people but also older men, because some of us men aren't growing up very quick. And we spend a lot of time on computer games that love the idea of violence, that, that that the main thing is to enjoy killing people. If that's what I'm filling my mind with, if that's what I'm training my soul on, then I am choosing deliberately to entertain myself and to train myself against who I am as a child of God and against who God is as the very source of life. And so there may be cases when there is a legitimate taking of human life in accordance with Romans 13. The, the, uh, the Lord tells us that the government is his minister, bears the sword, and bearing the sword means having the authority to take human life if it is necessary. We see it Uh, At the end of question answer 105, therefore also the government bears the sword to prevent murder. So there is a place for just execution, the just taking of human life. But it's not something believers consider cool or wonderful. We don't delight in war and in death and even in legitimate execution. It is a terrible thing to take a human life, even if the person who died is a terrible person, because they were still created in the image of God. And it is still a terrible thing that there is less life and not more life in the world. And it is a terrible thing 
especially terrible thing for us believers, that the evildoer now no longer has the chance to hear the gospel and to repent and to live forever. And so Christians do not glorify the taking of human life. We don't find it entertaining and we don't treat it as something unimportant. Christians also do not deliberately take human life. We always choose life because this, this, this is the character of our God. This is the character of our Savior. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. And we are in the world as his representatives, as his children, as people who are changed to be like him. We will not deliberately take the life of other persons who are inconvenient to us. We will not kill our elderly. We will not destroy our unborn. We will not cheerfully blow away somebody who happens to be taking uh, something from our property because we consider human life more important than worldly things. We value life as Christians, and we want more of it, not less, in the world. God gives life, and only God has the right to take life. That's what the scripture teaches. You think of Psalm 104, when he sends forth his spirit, they are created. When he takes away their breath, they are undone and they return to the ground. God gives life, God takes it. And we as God's children fear to enter into what is only God's authority. So Christians do not glorify the taking of human life. We do not deliberately take human life ourselves. Rather, we celebrate it. We embrace the cultural mandate that God gave three times to our first parents, seven times to Noah after the flood. We love it. We embrace it. We live by it. We love the idea, don't we, of filling the world with lots and lots and lots of God worshipers. And so that means that Christians love children. It means that Christians don't imitate the world in seeking the things of this life first, and when we've got all of our money and comfort all taken care of, then we might think about starting a family. We do the important things first. We love children. We do not deliberately prevent the birth of children unless it is absolutely necessary. We will not do it just for any reason. We don't celebrate destroying life, but we also don't celebrate suppressing life. And this is important for young couples who are about to get married, who have just been married, that we don't start to think of ourselves as little gods. We don't start to think that having children is like a tap. You can turn on or turn off. If you repress the natural biological function of the wife's body for a long time, that can have consequences. And when you finally want to open the tap and say, okay, now God, now you can give us some children, that's not an automatic thing. And the longer you've suppressed what is natural and created, the more chance there is of having difficulty to turn that around. Something to think about for young couples. We love life. We don't destroy it. We don't suppress it. If God doesn't give children, or if we are single, we still love life, and we still don't destroy it. We still don't suppress it, but we seek prayerfully other ways in which we can promote it cultivate it and enrich it. And so if you are a young, or if you are a mother who, or a wife, sorry, who has no children, if you're a couple that has no children, if you're single, you have no children, you are still called to reflect in your life the fact that you serve the God of life. You are, you are called to cultivate, promote, and enrich life. And God has given you a special job. He's decided not to give you children, but he's calling you to cultivate and enrich and promote life in another way. And that's something you need to prayerfully figure out. Now, Christians taught by the Spirit to love life promote it in every way. And this is the point that the Catechism makes as well. 
It's not enough to simply not go around murdering people. That's what the Pharisees thought. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he calls them out on that. If you open your Bibles in Matthew chapter 5, we're there in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. And if we just keep reading a little bit past our text, you look at verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. What is Jesus saying? He's saying you're angry, you insult, you call your brother a fool, you have a broken relationship and bitterness in your heart with a brother. That anger, that insulting, that hatred in your heart is murder and will get the same penalty if it's not repented of. And so the Lord Jesus, God, is not calling us simply to refrain from murdering people physically. He's calling us to refrain from anything which leads up to that act. And that includes all the things that the catechism lists here in the, in the Lord's day that is before us. So we are taught to promote life. And that means that anything which in any way leads to destroying life, we despise and reject and turn away from as God's children. That means we're careful with our thoughts. We're careful with our words, we're careful with our gestures, and we're careful with our deeds. How easy it is to hurt someone. How easy it is to break someone down. And we think, well, it's just words or it's just attitudes, you know. But how many people, brothers and sisters, how many people over the years have not left the Canadian Reformed churches because they were lonely and they were isolated and sometimes they were bullied at school and they were just on the fringe of the congregation. They felt unloved, unwanted, not belonging. And when they finally wandered off into the world or into some church which is not as faithful, we were quite free with our judgment about how that was a bad thing. But how, how many times have we stopped to reflect on the fact that we were not speaking and acting in a way to bring life to these people, that we were pushing them away from the communion. It's something for us to think about. You know, they say words, they can't do much. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's what we used to chant at each other when we were kids in elementary school if somebody said something nasty, but it's not true, is it? Words can hurt. Words can hurt terribly. A few years ago, a young girl in BC, Amanda Todd, was bullied relentlessly by her schoolmates. They made fun of her in real life. They made fun of her online. And she committed suicide. Words can hurt. Words can kill. She was murdered by hateful, unkind thoughts and words and gestures and deeds. And when we, children of God, see something like that, we say, no, that's not right. We hate those hateful things. And that means you, children, when you're at school or when you're in a group and somebody's making fun of someone, You are a child of God. You love your neighbor. You love life. You don't want to see people being hurt. And so if somebody's being made fun of or bullied, you stand next to them. You stand with them. And you don't just look on or, even worse, participate. Because looking on and participating is the sin of murder by the Bible's definition and by the church's confession. So Christians are taught by the Spirit to love life, and that means taking good care of our own lives. We are called to 
make our whole life a, a, a sacrifice of thankfulness to the Lord. It means if we turn to Romans 13 through to 11 through to 14, that we have a very different attitude. Romans 13, 11 to 14. Besides this, you know that the, the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, nor in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, see what the apostle's saying here is that the way that the children of darkness live is a way which is unhealthy on every level for the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit. It's sexual immorality, it's drunkenness, which destroys you, any kind of drunkenness, whether it's with alcohol or in sobriety, uh, lack of sobriety with, uh, with drugs, it wrecks your body, it wrecks your mind. Quarreling and jealousy, people that live in anger and hatred and yelling and fights and conflict all the time, that destroys them on every level, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And the apostle says, that's not what Jesus came to die for so that you could live like that. He came, he died, so that you could put on his character, so you could be like him and make no provision for the flesh. And that means as a Christian, and this, is, this comes into the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, it also involves uh, not putting my own life in danger in any way. That means that even such a thing as being uh, given over to drinking too much alcohol or taking mind-altering substances and thinking that that's a fun way to live is amongst other things sin against the sixth commandment. Drinking too much destroys your body. It destroys the organs of your body. And it is... It is sin against the first commandment if it becomes an addiction, but it is sin against the sixth when it is wrecking not only your body, but also your spirit, your soul, and your relationships and your family. So there are all kinds of ways in which the world tries to seduce us and call us to break this commandment. And the Holy Spirit calls us away from all of that, away from the kingdom of darkness, away from the, the lusts of the flesh, away from that, that way of life where you use others and you use yourself up and you use the creation for your own pleasure until everything's used up and everything's destroyed. That's what the world calls life. And you see what it does. Have you ever seen the pictures of the person the day they started taking meth and then a year later? and it looks like somebody a hundred years older. That's what sin, that's what living, the living death of the world does to you. It destroys you on every level. And as Christians, we say, no, I want none of that. I don't even wanna begin the first step down that path. And so part of living in the world is that you push yourself to the limits with, with drugs and unsafe sexual practices and extreme activities. You, you throw caution to the winds. You live dangerously. You wake up and you don't even remember where the party was. And the world says, that is so much fun. That's a great way to live. If you die, at least you died having fun. And people, the only people that can do that are people that have empty souls that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture teaches us the opposite. You remember this morning we read Matthew chapter four, the devil said to Jesus, throw yourself down. The Bible says that the angels will swoop down and save you from, from hurting yourself. And the Lord Jesus refused. He did not just simply throw himself into dangerous situations for, the, for, for any kind of reason. He took care of his health and his life. To neglect self-care, to endanger your life and your health is to defy God and to put him to the test and is sin 
against the sixth commandment. Now, the government, uh, we learn in the fifth commandment, is the minister of God, bears the sword to prevent the most egregious breaking of the sixth commandment, which is murder. But the sixth commandment, as we've already said, is not just the forbidding of the act of murder. The act of murder, in biblical terms, is the final poisonous flowering of a whole organic bunch of sins which lead up to it. And so in question answer 106, we learn about all those sins. The root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, desire for revenge. These are all part of the murder prohibited in the sixth commandment. I want to invite you to open the word of God to 1 John 3 verse 11. We'll look at a few verses there. 1 John 3 verse 11 through to 15. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever hates or everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So what does the Bible say? We love God. We, we love our neighbor. We love righteousness. We love God's law. Death is the opposite. Death is hating God and hating your brother. Loving sin, hating God's law. Now, maybe this afternoon you look into your heart and you realize that there's a, a long-standing anger or bitterness or resentment against someone, maybe against your own husband or wife, maybe against a brother or sister in the congregation. And you've just been nursing that maybe for years, maybe for a very long time. Well, the Lord Jesus commands you in, Rome, in, in Matthew chapter 5 to deal with this before the final judgment. Judgment is coming, and whatever is not settled now will be settled then. And if I'm living with anger in my heart against my brother, and I'm not dealing with it, then I shall be put up on charges of murder before the judgment seat of God. This is not a small thing. This is a very, very solemn and serious call to put all hatred, all resentment, all bitterness away and to seek the power of the Holy Spirit to reconcile, to restore, and to renew relationships in the love of God, the love of Christ. Now this is something that we need to be choosing constantly. Every day we're making choices. We read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He's, Moses has set the whole law in front of them, and then he sums it all up there in the, in the verses we read. Look, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. Now choose life. That's what he calls them to do. And that's a, that's a call that we have every day. In every situation, every moment, every day, we got to keep making that choice. Do we choose life? Do we choose death? Do we choose life? Do we choose death? Somebody cuts us off on the, on the road. Do we choose life or death in how we react? Somebody says something unpleasant to us, unkind to us. Somebody mistreats us. Do I cultivate anger and resentment? Do I choose death? Do I cultivate, cultivate forgiveness and reconciliation? Do I choose life? That's an ongoing thing every moment of our Christian life. And that's what we're called to do. Now we're listening to all these things, and perhaps you're thinking, well, this is a little bit difficult to do, and it seems a little bit hard, a very high standard. And then the minister is telling me that if I don't get this right, I'm going to come up before the judgment seat of God on charges of murder. Well, we don't want to go home at this point. We have to understand something more of the gospel, because brothers and sisters, we can't do this. We cannot keep this come up. We simply can't. You know, we look at our children. Nobody has to teach them to argue, right? Did you ever send your children to school to, to learn how to argue and fight and to steal each other's toys and to complain about each other and to slap each other and to pull each other's hair when they're very angry? 
Well, nobody had to teach them that because that's how we come. That's how we're born as sinners. Arguing, fighting, cutting words, anger, envy, selfishness, shoving, desire for revenge. I ain't going to get you back. Remembering the things that my brother did against me you know, months ago and I'll get him back when he's, when he's uh, not even expecting it. We see that in our children. And we don't like it, do we? But then we look in the mirror. We look in the mirror of God's law and we realize that we're exactly the same, us big people, except we're just better at hiding it. We're just better at camouflaging it. How much hatred and envy and anger and desire for revenge is not in my heart? How much have I not dishonored and hated and injured my neighbor by my thoughts and words and gestures and even my deeds? How careless have I not been with my own life and with my own health? You know, when we look at ourselves and we see that we're simply not up to it to keep this commandment in any way, then the danger is that guilt oppresses us. Because I've hurt people in my life. I've talked trash about other people, also online or in real life. I've hated people, maybe for a long time. I've I've gossiped about them. I've found a certain joy in mentioning something really unpleasant about them to other people and spreading that so that they're known by that shameful thing. And I've gotten joy out of that as a gossiper. I've wished them ill. Sometimes people even close to me, sometimes even brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. Maybe I have hated a life within me and I've wished harm on my unborn child. Maybe I have even done that. Maybe I've even destroyed the life that was in me. What are we to do when we feel condemned by this commandment? Well, brothers and sisters, we need to go to what God tells us every Sunday from this pulpit and every time we have the Lord's Supper table set before us and every time we see a little child being baptized and we're reminded of our own baptism. God is saying every time the word is preached, every time the sacraments are administered, God is saying it is gone. All that guilt, all that shame... All that filth and foulness of sin, it is gone. There's nothing left. All of our miserable, shameful brokenness with respect to the sixth commandment is done. It's wiped away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we come to church Sunday after Sunday, brothers and sisters, because we need to hear that, that our sins are gone. They don't exist anymore. They've been nailed to the cross. And Jesus comes to us again today and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. The gospel is this, that in Christ I keep the sixth commandment. In Christ I keep this commandment perfectly. In Christ, I have never done a thing to destroy life. Not the smallest thing. But in Christ, in the righteousness that I have in Christ, I have only ever loved and promoted life. That is true of you. When God looks at you, child of God, He sees men, women, and children who have never done a thing to hurt anyone. Not the slightest thought, not the slightest word. He sees you as men, women, and children who are so full of kindness and love and grace and goodness as to be reflecting the very character of Jesus himself. That is the gospel. And that's why we hold on to the Lord Jesus, because we love to know who we are in him. And so, child of God, go from here in the power of the Spirit of Christ into another week and live. Be full of life. Revel 
in the life that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the life of the kingdom come to fill you and transform you and overflow from you. May everyone you meet, everywhere you go, may you bring life to them. Not the stench of death, but the sweet aroma of the life that only Christ can give. And in the power of the Spirit, may you so love life that you are known for your patience, peace, gentleness, mercy, and friendliness. In your thoughts, in your demeanor, in your internet conversations, in your gaming and entertainment, in your dealings with your neighbors and co-workers, in your comments about other drivers on the road, may our children see it, may others see it, that we are children of the light, that we are children of the kingdom of life, that we are full of the life of God himself, that we choose life, that we love life, because Christ loved us and we love him. Amen. Well, let's singing hymn number 79, stanza four, stanza 4. And then we will remain standing and confess our faith by singing the Apostles' Creed. In our prayer of thanksgiving, we'll also remember before the Lord, Reverend Slomp, he's going in for heart surgery on May the 4th. Let us come before the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. 
Father, thank you for drawing us from the kingdom of darkness and death into the kingdom of light and life of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that the gospel changes everything about who we are and how we live in the world. And we ask that from week to week as we hear the word preached and from day to day as we read it and meditate upon it and study it, we pray that the the Holy Spirit would work in us the principle of true life. May May we be life givers, O Lord. May we be people that when we walk into a room, into a, a new job, into a, a new organization, into, a, into any kind of context, may we be people who are known as the people that bring life to every conversation, to every situation, to every project and organization, that we are the ones that bring true life. And so teach us, Lord, more and more to be like Christ, to hate everything that has to do with death, and to celebrate the life that is life indeed. And so sanctify us by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. We bring before you Reverend Slomp. We thank you that even though he is emeritus, he's retired, he can still serve the churches in many ways, and especially that we are blessed to have him filling the pulpit in the different churches. We bring our brother, Reverend Slump, before you, Lord, as there's a very serious, uh, involved operation coming up on May 4th. We pray that you will give him and his wife and family peace with your providential uh, ordinances, how you have ordained things to be. We know that this comes from your fatherly hand. We pray that you would bless the surgeons and the support staff, that you would grant a successful surgery, that you would grant a good recuperation, and if it be your holy will, allow our brother Reverend Slump to return to his activities, including the preaching of the gospel. We pray for each of the families in the church, Lord. We pray for our marriages, for husband and wife to live in love, uh, seeking, Lord, one another in Christ to, to serve one another by encouraging one another in holiness and sanctification. Uh, tear out by the root, Lord, all selfishness, all sinfulness, all the imposing of our wants and desires on others, Grant that there may be much joy and health in holy marriage. Grant that also in the home, Lord, a good relationship between husband and wife, between parents and children, their homes may be places of peace and life, joy and love. And we pray, Lord, that you'd also give us opportunities to open up our homes, to show Christian hospitality to each other, but also to others who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may come in to a taste of heaven when they see a family that is filled with your peace and your love and your life, and that this may incite the unbeliever, Lord, to to want to know more about the gospel. So give us opportunities, we pray, to be a blessing to others in this way as well. Bless us in our work and wherever we're working or studying or in our involvement in the community. May we be known as children of God, as people who bring love and life to every situation. We pray for the Canadian Food Grains Bank and our offering. Bless these holy gifts. Bless the work of this organization, that it may be for your glory that these holy gifts are sent and used. We pray for the elders and the deacons. We pray that you would give them wisdom in their respective offices, that you would give them humility, faithfulness, joy in their task, even though it is often hard work with a lot of time dedicated to it. Give them the energy they need, Lord, both physically and spiritually and mentally. Bless their wives and children who sacrifice time with dad and with husband as he gives himself to the work of the office, and would you, would you bless the families that make that sacrifice out of love for you 
and for your church. We pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayer, that you would be with us as we go into a new week. We pray, Lord, that as we're one day, one week closer to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he might come quickly so that we can see the full consummation of the gospel that we hear and love so much, that we may see Jesus himself and the new heavens and the new earth, and that we may really begin living life the way it was meant to be lived, with no sin, no brokenness, no tears, no uh, conflict, no pain, no death, but only everlasting, overflowing, overabundant joy, life, and love. We look forward so much to that day, Lord, and while we wait for it, help us to begin living it already now in the power of your Spirit. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. We have the opportunity to give our thank offerings to the Lord for the work of Canadian Food Grains Bank. Then we stand to sing our final song, Hymn 79, stanza 5. Lift up your hearts, receive the blessing of the Lord, and depart in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.